posted like a picture of myself, oxygen mask up my nose, in the bed in ICU saying, look, here I am, mum of four, running two businesses, charity, mensch, hands up, always helping everyone else, never put myself first. And here I am in ICU, don't be me, hashtag slow the fuck down. And I don't really remember <laughs> writing it, I'm going to be honest. Um, but it was very me to do that. And it exploded. I mean, it broke LinkedIn. It, it had 9 million views, which is, is wow. something on TikTok or Instagram you might get. But on LinkedIn, 100 grand, 100,000 views is like mega. Welcome to the Parentpreneur Show. Parenting and entrepreneurship, two of life's more demanding roles. And what happens when you try to balance them both? Well, on the Parentpreneur Show, we give you an honest look at the lives of parents actually doing this. I'm your host, Michael J. Christian, and as a parent with my own entrepreneurial pursuits, I know the constant struggle of trying to do everything. But I also know the great joy I get from providing for my family whilst building something of worth. I am thrilled to have Emma Harris joining me on the show today. Emma is the founder and the chief of Glow London, a brand engagement agency, and is also a speaker, coach and mentor. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank and you. Could you briefly could you briefly introduce yourself both as a an entrepreneur and as a parent uh yeah well i think you've done it really i i um i run an agency called glow i uh back in the day i was uh i was at Eurostar for 10 years that's probably where i sort of built my reputation so i led sales and marketing for Eurostar uh up till 2012 and then i sort of interestingly jumped out the day i signed my agreement, it took them a long t- time to let me go. And the day I eventually agreed to go, um, I found out I was pregnant with my first child. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then uh, was, you know, dabbled in consulting for a while and then eventually um, set up the business. Um, I have four children, um, which is very relevant for this podcast. So I have actually, I've got buy one, get two free when I met my husband. So I have uh, a 22 year old, a 20 year old, an 11 year old and a six year old. Um, so as I always say, we've got sex, drugs and rock nursery rhymes. You know, we've got it all going. It's a 24 hour operation. Where's this one? You know, make sure that one's behaving. Give that one a bedtime story. It's all, it's, it's full on. I I love that. Yeah, I I, I empathise a hundred percent with you. It's like a well-run military operation in our household. And uh, if you don't find me here at my desk, you'll find me standing on the edge of some astro pitch somewhere around the southeast. So yeah. So let's dive into this a little bit more. Um, And I love your comment there. You you sort of left a, a corporate role and a very good one by the sounds of it and took quite the common path it's one I took myself as well and you kind of went into consulting what kind of drew you to that was it the idea that you'd have the flexibility you'd have more freedom and and probably with it more of the more of the pie yeah I mean I think at the time to be honest I came out and thought I've been working my ass off since I was, you know, I mean, I really started working when I was 15. You know, my parents, I had a very nice upbringing, but my parents were very keen that we always paid our way. So I started working, selling jeans in a clothes shop in North Finchley at 15. And it just worked all the way through university. I worked from the minute I came out of university, spent a year in the States, worked there. I'd just been working and felt, okay, I'm going to jump out. And I'd done a lot at Eurostar. We'd rebranded we you know totally grown the business we survived a snow crisis and a fire in the tunnel and we'd moved from Waterloo to St Pancras which I I led the change management for that so I came out was pretty knackered and obviously pregnant and didn't know whether I wanted to be an earth mother or throw a nanny at the baby I just you know I had two sep kids but that they were seven and nine so I'd never had a baby before um, and a lot of my friends were like, can you help us with this? Having been at Eurostar where during a time when social media was launched, a big responsibility of mine as, as somebody in charge of the brand was to embed the brand right the way through the business because you can't do beautiful adverts and then someone walks into St Pancras and sees someone in a uniform with a face like a slapped arse. It's kind of, you know, ruined the experience. And when I was working with HR and and customer services and trying to embed the brand into every moment of that experience, there was no one behind me helping me. There was no agency. 
do an advert you've got people lining up to spend millions of pounds but this Mm. kind of work there was no one so when I came out there was a lot of people saying can you help us with our brand um because I'd done the big brand transformation and a lot of change management so a lot of my mates that were either CMOs or led agencies were like can you help us with this can you help us with that so I just sort of fell into it and then obviously being pregnant I thought well I'll get a grown-up job eventually and did actually go I went for an interview I went for an interview at Camelot a really CMO job at Camelot and Ava was three months old I cried all the way to the interview and all the way home I was still breastfeeding I was awake you know I was having no more than three hour sleep chunk at a time um, and thought what am I doing and then I got offered a job Um, with a very large global uh, car rental business. I don't know if the guy ever listens, he'll probably be rocking in a corner somewhere because we've got to the stage. He was looking for a sales director and a marketing director. I convinced him just to to employ me and that he wouldn't need both because if I was the marketing director, I'd just be interfering in sales anyway. Um, So just pay me a bit more and give me both. And we'd literally clink champagne glasses and then that was on a Friday and on the over the weekend I happened to go away with the girls for a spa weekend at the place where I would be working and I just felt sick all weekend thinking I can't do this you know I can't I can't I can't do this I'm not I'm going to not see my kids and I I'm going to feel trapped and I know and I'm on a roundabout in the middle of like Maidenhead rather than being even if being in the centre of London you just feel more connected I'm in London I've always always lived in London and I literally phoned him up on the Monday and said, I, I'm really sorry, I can't do this. I'll do it for a year. Give me a year's contract. I'll do all the things I promised I'd do because I'm all about brand transformation. And he said, I can't do it. It's a team. I need to give them someone that's going to be there. And and I think that was really a moment for me where I dodged a bit of bullet. Um, and then I said, okay, I'm going to do some proper consulting. Then I had six months working. Um, well, my mum died. Um, and it's quite lonely being a consultant and uh, my sister and my brother, I'm Jewish. And so we sat shiver and then sort of, you know, you get surrounded by people for a a week. You've got, you know, everyone and his wife bringing you roast chicken and stuff. And then, Mm -hmm. and then everyone goes and then everyone disappears. And I I was like, okay, I need a job. I need a distraction. I need a, a brand. I need a team. I need an office. And ended up working, and I'm not going to say which business is a business I've always thought would be a perfect for me. And it was six really difficult months because the culture was really toxic, and I got quite badly bullied, and it was it was a tough time for me. Um, and then when I came out of there, I thought, okay, that's it, and that's when I set up Glow properly. And our proposition is all about connecting brand and culture to make sure whatever your brand is, the way you speak about your business is clear and differentiated and you're not saying the same stuff that everyone else does and then finding great ways to get that message out there and then making sure that the business is delivering on that promise to avoid those toxic cultures, to make sure no one else ever experiences the stuff that I've experienced. I know lots of other people are experiencing now. That's what we do. So we make sure the brand and the culture are aligned. And then, um, and yeah, that was the beginning of it sort of probably around 2016 um and then um about 2018 one of my clients an amazing business called planet k2 who are all about human performance uh, they're human performance experts most of them have spent you know 25 years in olympic sport and they help business people think prepare and perform like elite athletes because there is no arena more than sport that mm-hmm. understands performance you know th- the theory of marginal gains and how you approach it in a, an emotional and a mental way as much as as a physical and tactical and a, a technical um and they came to me and said we want to buy a brand consultancy because what we're recognizing is a lot of our businesses are not performing because their internal and their external is disconnected and if you know if we don't buy you we're going to buy someone else i was like well don't buy anyone else so they they bought part of the business so now I'm part of a a bigger group of companies and the business has been going officially that's when we sort of became a grown-up business um that was beginning of 2019 and it's been an amazing so you know four years that's fantastic I'd I'd like to circle back there's like a load of points you've just thrown up there and I'm going to circle right back to North Finchley selling jeans when you were 15 (laughs) 
do you think you are born or you become an entrepreneur? Did you go, I, I, I was very much the same as you. I actually used to deliver groceries to the little old lady on the back of my bicycle when I was like six, living in my little village where I grew up. And uh, she'd give me 10 p and one of those Canuck tea cakes sort of thing, you know? Um, would, um, were you kind of, was it a means to an end or was it, was it you thinking, right, I, I want to go out there and do something in the world for myself? <clears throat> I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if it, it's, I'm a natural entrepreneur. I think I'm a natural business person. You know, I could always look at any organization and see how to improve it. I remember when I was at Waterloo, giving the bagel stand feedback about how inefficient their processes were because it frustrated me. I'm just, you know, just, <laughs> and when I was selling jeans at 15, we would earn 14 pounds on a Saturday. That's how old I am. And, we would get three pound bonus if we had top sales and my god did i work hard for that three pounds and i don't know if it was about what three pounds could buy you although it was a lot in those days um but it was about the competitiveness so i think i've always been competitive and i've always had that sort of a business natural business acumen my dad even though he left 15 was a working class east end boy had had a great brain for math should have been an accountant um and he, you know, was was a managing director of a, a um, camping equipment business and then set up on his own. So when I was about 12, bought his own business. So I, I've always been a bit of a chip off the old block. Yeah. But I don't know if I, uh, when I met my husband, I was 16. Um, we haven't been together since then. We're not one of those couples. But when I met him, I was 16. He's an actor. And um, he was very clear that he was going to be an actor and I was very clear that I was going to be a businesswoman. So I don't know if that's entrepreneur, but I just knew that was going to be my future. I think it's having a clear goal, isn't it? And mm. so many people and sadly a lot of grown-ups, even peers around me, I, I see them kind of just bumbling from one day to the next. And, and I, I feel quite sad when I see that. Mm, I mean, one of the ways I live my life, and I'm sure we'll get on to some of this stuff, but one of the ways I live my life, I'm a big believe in the power of manifestation and I, and I don't mean that in the sort of well if we pray that we'll see a feather it'll appear but what for me there's science behind that um and I believe you can have anything you want in life there are two conditions upon which that is true one is knowing what you want and a lot of people don't know some of those bumblers don't know and the second one is to know you're going to have it not hope or wish or think um and a lot of people see manifestation as a wish but for me it's about being clear on the on the outcome setting because that's how your brain works 95 percent of our behavior is unconscious so if we, and our unconscious minds don't know time so if we can actually it's like programming your sat nav if we know something to be true and we can create that belief with outcome setting visualization um vision boards just even the sort of power of our, our mental thinking, um, if we can programming that sat nav, it will take us there. That's I firmly believe that, Matt, is how I live my life every day. I love that. And now I'm going to dive straight in now. We said we'll dive into it later, but no, let's do that now because I, I'm very, very clear on that as well. I, I write things down each day. I have a very clear, you know, sort of view of what I want, a very clear goal. Um, my screensavers, when they pop up, that's my vision board. Me too. My, is it? It's a nice yeah. way of doing it. It's Love such a it. great way. Yeah, it just it's subliminal. Yeah, yeah, it's Absolutely. there. The power of subliminal messaging is awesome. Mm. And it's just little things like just before I go to bed and just as soon as I wake up, I'll read my little goal card. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan in that sense. Um, Bob Proctor, that's where I got a lot of that from. And I love that. But my, my, my eldest, Thomas, he's nine and a half, well, nine and seven months because it's important when you're that age, isn't so it? So important. And uh, he is a mad keen football and, you know, give him his due. He's actually pretty good. His mom's Brazilian. So there's, you know, something in that maybe. Um, he really wants to be, every kid wants to be a footballer or a train driver or a pilot at that age. But, you know, he's determined to the point where he actually writes notes down and reads them and looks at them. He goes up to the coach at the end of sessions and say, what can I do better? And he wow. gets really frustrated with them if they turn around and say, no, you were really good tonight. Yeah, but, yeah, and, and, and it is having that present presence of mind and and you're absolutely right i talk about having an operating system to my kids wow. you know and and i think these are the things 
these are the great things that as as a parent preneur i've learned that i can give to my kids it's not the stuff it's the information the knowledge absolutely absolutely i mean i talked to my my 22 year old has has been working in the corporate world and he's like everyone around me is so unhappy they're earning 10 times what i earn and he's the bottom of the ladder and I don't, what am I aspiring to? If they're unhappy, when am I ever going to be happy? And I've been saying to him, the quest is not the stuff, like you say, the stuff. Because you go through life going, when I when I get that job, when I earn that much money, when I buy that car, when I buy that flat, when I buy that house, I'll be happy. When I'm thin enough, you know, when, when I've got the right whatever, the handbag, I'll be happy. And we put our happiness in front of us. And we attach our happiness to, I don't know if you've read the status game, but we attach our happiness to status rather than, and actually the quest is self-acceptance. The quest is to be able to look in the mirror in the morning and say, I'm, I like you, I'm okay. Mm. And, and in that also to, to harness the power of your own ability to achieve by feeling you're, you're, you're in control. Because when you're in control and you have self-acceptance, those two things for me is the, is the key to sort of happiness and, and fulfillment. I love that. And, and I wish, my, I wish someone had said that to me when I was nine and a half. I tell you, our, our kids lucky that they've got all this and they're not, they don't listen all the time, but you know, somewhere it's going in. Oh, I, I hope somewhere it goes in. I, I kind of leave podcasts playing as I'm driving around to football training in, in the hope that it's it's sinking in. Yeah. And he's like, nah, can we have Stormzy, please? Dad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. going in. It's subliminal. It's subliminal. It is. But then he starts saying, bruv. So, so bruv. Stormzy's, Stormzy's going in as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you, I love that as well. With manifestation, you say it's not about thinking, I want to see a white feather and poof, it appears. But you mentioned as well in connection with, you know, sort of top elite sport about incremental gains and swapping book titles here. I've written down status game. Um, there's a great one. I'm in Marlow, which is a big growing town and Olympic growers are, you know, you can't help but bump into them. Um, and one of them wrote the book going, does it make the book boat go, go faster? faster. Yeah. yeah. And, and it is those tiny incrementals. So when it comes to manifesta uh, manifestation, I find that if I do smile at myself, if I do say hi to someone as I mm. pass them on the high street, yeah, or then I, you know, I, quite often I do it because it's fun. I'll just say, look, there's the money for my coffee. I go to the same coffee shop every day and here's the money for the next person behind me. Oh, um, I love that. And just, and just little things like that. And those tiny little incremental gains, sure, yeah. you don't get instant gratification, but you do, you, you do get an overwhelming sense. You kind of like align your vibration. You align your energy into a really positive direction, which then opens you up to the, you know, the, the, the bigger picture. So I mean, you have to start small. I agree. It's even as small as every time you brush your teeth, right? You brush your teeth every night. How did I do today? What could I have done better? You know, what were the great moments? What were the moments I did differently? Having that moment of reflection, you know, we don't, we just plow on. And then in the morning, choosing how I want my day to go, choosing how I want to feel the next time I brush my teeth, how, 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 you know, setting my outcome for the day. All these yeah. tiny little rhythms and rituals that people like the guys that wrote, um, that doesn't make the boat go faster. And by the way, um, our program director, um, Chris Shambrook, Dr. Chris Shambrook is the GB, was for 25 years, was the sports psychologist for GB Worry. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and one of the things we talk about all the time, in fact, if the people I, that bought me the yellow roses are listening, um, that's something we talked about yesterday is the having that gold medal winning question that we ask ourselves to give ourselves that clarity and purpose. Does it make the boat go faster? It's brilliant, brilliant ways to, to think and live. It, it's um it's it's what i call my annual review with the guys who were with me for a year i go right we're going to do the does it make my boat does go faster we're going to look at the year and it's fantastic yeah. one more thing i want to pick up on before we go forwards um and this is something that you know i empathize and share with you um when you mentioned about your mum dying this is as much so my my parents both died and i remember we were on the lawn of of their house having a toast i'm one i'm the youngest of four and then there's kids grandkids and all the rest going on around that now i'm 12 years younger than the oldest and I just went and I just raised a glass. I said, well, here's to being orphans, you know, because mm. I've got a, a fairly black sense of humor. And then I've gone away from that thinking, crikey, you know, from the simplest things. My mom was an amazing cook and I'd always pick her brains. Um, she was a great, calm influence on my dad, on the other kids, on me. 
and I miss that in a big way. And I miss that as well in a day to day with with respect to my business, having that kind of that sage sort of person in the background. How how have you sort of felt? Have you had a similar feeling, or do you find yourself talking to your mum? Or big question. So I also am an orphan. So and we, my sister brother and I, do refer to ourselves as orphans, even though we're all in our fifties. I think that's still relevant. My mum got ill when I was 12. Um, so about the time that dad bought the business and became this sort of entrepreneur, um, my mum got a thing called a viral viral encephalitis, which settled on her short-term memory. Encephalitis can settle. It's a virus that settles in the brain. I've met people that have had encephalitis that when they recovered, they didn't know how to walk again. So it can affect any part of your brain. For my mum, it was her short-term memory function. So from the age of 12, I kind of, and my mum was like me, alpha female, you know, running the world with three kids, you know, football, clarinet, piano. My dad just was, you know, a sort of lovable, wonderful man that just followed her around and did whatever he was told. And she was the boss. And she was really the hostess with the mostess she was an absolute shining light she was very involved in the school she was in the pta she would get involved in all the productions we did and then overnight she disappeared overnight she became a goldfish so overnight i lost that that guidance she was still alive she lived for another 30 years but she didn't have that ability to guide me anymore so my sister and I kind of brought ourselves up me and my sister is older than me um you know really kind of took on a lot of that role but as the youngest one I became the boss of the house I ran the house with my dad I did the shopping and I did the cooking and I made sure while she was really ill that everything you know it was like well mummy's not here so someone needs to do it my sister was sort of 15 and quite adolescent and my brother was 17 and never at home so I became that person and I do think that's made me who I am today and I've got a lot of my mum in me a lot of her friends say oh god you're just like your mother and I'm the hostess with the mostess I'm the alpha female you know and so she lives in me for sure but it's almost like the woman she was when I was younger not really the ill woman that we all had to sort of care for for 30 she was still around she was still uh, the essence of her but when you have a conversation with someone and five minutes later they ask you the same question it's it's not the same and my dad died um four four years ago um and when she went he kind of just gave up really um but he also I mean I've got his sense of humor I've got his love of spurs I've got his love (laughs) of food I mean you know we so they kind of what happens for me is they become they they become a part of you so I, I, you know, I know my dad. My dad sadly never saw this house that I'm living in, but I know he would have loved it. You know, he he. My mum never met my little boy, and I know she'd have bitten lumps out of him. So it's they. It the grief is still there, but it becomes you just recognise the bits of you that that represent them. Yeah, it it, it becomes a kind of a familiar grief. You know, it kind of walks alongside you rather Mm. than sort of engulfing you. I had a similar but reverse experience. My father had dementia. So Mm. the guy he became, you know, very much a shell. Mm. Um, He could remember more about his under 11 football team Mm. than he could about the rest of his family, you know, in the later years. And similar, you know, although my mum, you know, lived for probably about six, seven years there afterwards, the spark had you know the spark was gone you know if mm. when you've been together with someone since your late teens as they yeah. had you know yeah. it's it's tough right well i it, it it's interesting because i'd like to talk a little bit more about glow london now as well and and your comment there about being alpha female and the hostess with the most s when mm. i first um, came across the, the website and started to do a bit of research it has got that familial feel about it i mean you've all got a fantastic title sophie who's really kindly you know set this all up for us she's entitled the ringmaster mm-hmm. you were just the the chief um but there's a real sort of family feel about it is that intentional is that what you've done there in terms of absolutely value? absolutely and we're a small business there's only six of us in the glow team and there's 18 in the planet k2 team but we are absolutely all you know the family is really important so keith hatter is the family of planet k2 you know he's someone 
who I would trust with my life. And, and all of us have this very deep connection. It's really important. Having worked in a corporate role, and it's one of the reasons I never went back, is that sort of corporate toxic working for people who think it's okay to speak to you in a certain way um and and those hierarchical structures where i mean even i've been you know and i coach people and i was coaching someone yesterday who kept referring to his team as my staff Ooh. and um you know even being in an environment where I think people think it's okay to refer to you as staff um i just i'm highly allergic to that and it's something we work really hard to help our clients create as well that that because people are people and if you spend of course uh, a third of your life working then make it count make it be somewhere where you can be seen and you belong and you're valued um so yeah that is highly intentional and i'm really blessed to have such a great you know team of people and i suppose blessed and also it is highly intentional our clients are the same our clients are wonderful because we choose to only work with wonderful people. So we haven't talked about what happened last year yet. I'm sure we're coming on to that. We, we will come on to um, that for sure. But particularly since I had a life-changing event last year, that choice of who I surround myself with has become really, really important because it's, you know, life is short. And so don't waste time allowing people to be in your life who take from you and who don't, add to the wonder that is your life so that is highly intentional i, I love it it's being clear on your values which we touched on before not everybody mm. is and then you know for me it's very binary it's does this take me closer to my goal or does it take me away it's a one or a zero it's mm. a black or a white so yeah and one of one of the fa my favorite phrases i think it was polish originally but it's like not my circus not my monkeys my kids love will ask that. me, what about that? What's going on there? What's going on? I said, not my circus, not yeah. my monkeys. And I'm, it's far from being ignorant. It's actually being very conscious as opposed mm. to being ignorant. But yes, you, you alluded to a life-changing incident. So just to, for, for a bit of context um, to, to the listeners, um, I woke up early one morning and I was listening to Wake Up to Money, which is on Radio 5 before the, the breakfast show. And I heard Emma tell this amazing and sort of life-changing event. So please and and we're fine with potty mounds here i think i said that to you earlier but please tell me all about the slow the fuck down movement and the event that led up to that movement okay well i've given you the picture of my life so four kids two step kids my husband's an actor he's away a lot traveling uh, at the time i was a rep for reception my little boy was in reception i was the rep also on the pta um running glow and also on the exec team of the social media business um which was pretty full on so and also trustee of the charity and just a mensch um you know slightly picking myself up i'm just one of those people that will always put my hand up and help people before i've even realized i've done it i'll be the person there's someone will mention on the group chat let's go to let's have a weekend away i've gone i've researched the hotels i've booked it i've spoken to the hotel i've organized gluten-free meals for people i'm just that person and i was in new york um i had been in chicago for a week with another client and i had a 20 48 hour gap between you know, the, the work in in chicago was finishing i think on the thursday and then i was starting work in new york on monday now, any sane person would have thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll fly to New York on Friday, stay there a couple of nights so that I'm ready for Monday. But but I've got four kids and Marley at the time was five. And I Danny was filming in Barcelona. So I flew home on the Friday for sort of 36, 48 hours to make sure everyone was okay. You know, there was notes on the fridge everywhere. I left little letters in Marley's close every day so that everyone would remember piano books and it's that mental load um i flew back to new york did a week in new york full-on week of meetings every day dinners every night um i'm i'm very into my fitness so i was getting up early every morning and running um or doing a hit class or something drinking a lot of coffee a lot of coffee patron um and on the friday we packed to leave and went for brunch in a restaurant in Tribeca. I stood up to go to the loo, slid apparently gracefully down the back of a chair and went into cardiac arrest from nothing. I mean, like I said, that morning I'd done a hit class. There's a picture I've got on my phone of me at 12.08, like a selfie looking not too dissimilar to how I look right now. 
And at 12.13, I stood up and had a cardiac arrest. There was no pre-existing conditions. It's what happened to Christian Erickson. Mm. No pre-existing conditions. I have a very healthy heart. Um, I have no blocked arteries. It wasn't a heart attack. It was a thing called ventricular fibrillation, which basically is your one of your ventricles in your heart is is vibrating so fast. It has these electrical pulses that the heart can't function. And so I went straight to cardiac arrest. I was incredibly lucky. The people I was with stood up and were shouting, "Is some can someone help us phone 911? And three people, three people stood up and they were doctors having brunch in the same restaurant. Wow. And they came over and, and saved my life, gave me CPR, got my heart going again. Um, an ambulance came within seven minutes um, and my heart stopped again in the ambulance. And, and apparently my friends that were with me, say that there were a lot two ambulances came for some reason there were a lot of people in and out of the ambulance and they were all just shaking their head like she's not going to make it um but they defib me twice and the second time my heart started again i got taken to a hospital they were saying she's got a lot going on someone had to phone my husband and give him the news and he got on a plane thinking he was coming to collect a body but i recovered i was in hospital there was 11 different things going on 11 different machines and every time they just took one off I was okay and then I was only on oxygen and I was okay um they cauterized the part of my heart which um was had the vf and gave me I've got a defib now in the side of that's it permanently attached mm. and um eight days in ICU and I was good to go and I about two days into ICU, stupidly, they'd left me with my phone because my memory, terrifyingly for my sister who'd flown out, I had no short-term memory, just like my mum. So I was in this sort of loop of not remembering everything. But they'd left me with my phone. So it didn't really occur to me that my kids didn't know what was going on. My clients didn't know what was going on. The story had been quite kept tightly embargoed till we knew what was happening. And I posted on LinkedIn and I'm a big believer in not always posting positive stuff. Posted like a picture of myself, oxygen mask up my nose, in the bed in ICU saying, look, here I am, mum of four, running two businesses, charity, mensch, hands up, always helping everyone else, never put myself first. And here I am in ICU, don't be me, hashtag slow the fuck down. And I don't really remember writing it, I'm going to be honest. Um, but it was very me to do that. And it exploded. I mean, it broke LinkedIn. It, it had 9 million views, which is is wow. something on TikTok or Instagram you might get. But on LinkedIn, 100 grand, 100,000 views is like mega. So it, it just kept getting shared and shared and shared. And there was this outpouring of love from all over the world. And people sharing their stories, particularly women saying, I'm reading this. You know, all these parent, parent entrepreneurs saying... You're, I'm listening to my own life. I don't ever put myself first. I'm crying while I'm, I'm thank you for sharing. And you're making me think I've got to stop. I've got to do something differently. People telling ridiculous stories about having heart attacks on the way to pitches and still do, going through with the pitch because they were scared of not doing the pitch. You know, people just saying they all put themselves last, put themselves last. And, um, and, and, you know, pledging to not do the same. And that kind of propelled me forward to want to do more. So I've been doing a lot of speaking. I've kind of created Slow the Fuck Down's become a talk that I do a lot. And it's sort of, there's three pillars that sit underneath it. One is this sort of make better choices. Because when I woke up in ICU, I, my first thought was, what the fuck have I been doing? <laughs> and you know, running around like a busy fool and not looking after myself. And there are four people that need me a lot. You know, I, there was a five-year-old I nearly left without a mum and that would have been his story. And it, and I realised a lot of the running around and the being a busy fool was just the stories I was telling myself in my head about we have to, I have to do this, I have to be there. If I don't do that, and, and you know, the, the catastrophizing we do, if I don't go to that event, I'll miss the biggest deal of my life. If I don't go to that party, I'll ruin her birthday. If I don't, you know, do everything I need to do for the school, then the, the world will be... I don't get the kids to school on time. Then I had this story in my head of my little boy, you know, crying to that school, into the classroom, and the teacher going, your parents are rubbish. I mean, all the stories we tell ourselves in our heads. So the first bit is about you know, make better choices, 
recognize what's important. Often we work ourselves to death to protect the thing we love, which is our families. And in doing that, we're missing bedtimes, we're missing bath times, and we're missing the footballs, we're missing the bits that are important. So it's about work out what's important to you and prioritize it and make sure the decisions you're making are based on evidence not thoughts and feelings because our thoughts and feelings don't exist and we can choose to change them. That's not negating emotional, negating mental health struggles, but it's just being in control of our thoughts. The second piece is around paying attention, paying attention to our bodies and, and using a lot of the work that we do in sort of the athlete at work principle about your physical and your mental and your contextual and controlling all that, and making better choices, not being out three, four nights a week, making sure you're not working weekends, watching on that. But, you know, downtimes is important as uptime for an athlete. Mm. Um, and then the third thing, in fact, there's probably four because it depends whether I'm talking to a very corporate audience. If I'm talking to individuals, I talk about manifest, don't stress. So the pa- rather than worrying, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Setting the outcome and focusing on the end goal and and the power of that. But the other thing is also about having the conversation and encouraging people to talk and share their struggles, encouraging leaders to set example by, you know, leaving the office to pick up their kids or go to that football game and tell everyone about it and, and set the example and enable that space for people to be parents and to be someone at work and to be human so it's it's those kind of those are sort of the four areas that that have become and it's changed lives i meet people all the time at events that are like thank you i've been following you it's making a difference i'm making more meaningful choices and that's that means the world i i I love that you took such what could have been well terminal situation and you just paid it forward in such an amazing way and you and you're right it's the only people who are going to remember you working late in 10 20 years time are your kids not the people you're around not your clients and and if if those kind of people hold that thing hold that against you then they're like you said earlier not the kind of clients you want to have i i regularly because i work for myself and i deliberately choose when and how and where i work i'll regularly bump into other parents that i know and they go oh having a coffee again I said yeah because I can and you're jealous you know it's my choice absolutely absolutely I'm always posting about yeah I did it you know this morning the reason when we first spoke I wasn't quite camera ready it's because I did a workout I had and and I had to slide a call in but I put me first you know so I had a client that that needed a last minute meeting so I could have you know, prioritize that client. They wanted to meet me earlier. They wanted to meet me at nine. And I said, no, I'm not going to meet you till 9.30 because that 30 minutes was my workout time. And mm. making, that's the kind of thing I do differently now. I would have thought, oh, no, I've got to do what the client wants. Um, but I know the importance of even just 20 minutes of exercise. And that's that's about sanity as much as, as vanity, um, the impact that has on my on my mental health as well as my physical health. So, you know, putting me first because it, but not just because I'm selfish, but because also it makes me a better mum, a better boss, a better partner, everything. 100%. It's, it's the old um, airplane analogy, isn't it? Putting on your it's mask first. It's so, so important. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't do those things. So for, for me, I if you looked at my calendar, you'd laugh because it is literally blocked out from six in the morning until eight at night. But six until seven is me time so go for a walk go on the rowing machine you know do some journaling or reading seven till nine lunch boxes breakfasts school runs and then you know, everything's broken down i think it was jocko willink the ex navy seal said that freedom lies within the discipline you Absolutely. know and you just put yourself there put everything make a priority Learn to say no. I, I say this to a lot of the guys I work with. You just need to learn to say no. Is that Absolutely. important? And and recognize why you're saying yes. I think that's the thing mm. is that story's in our heads because often it's FOMO. And, and I'm not just talking about, you know, social FOMO, which we all have because we imagine the minute we leave the bar, you know, Beyonce is going to walk in and we'll have missed it. But actually, <laughs> and that's the thing is that, yeah, okay, evidence versus thoughts and feelings. So, that's a thought that Beyonce might walk in the bar the minute we left. But actually, what is the evidence that she is coming? There is none. So make that decision based on evidence. I am tired. I was out last night. I am going home now. 
And so being really conscious of the reasons why we're saying yes, there's, a, there's I don't know if you read any Jay Shetty, but Jay Shetty, uh, think like a monk, he talks about, I'm not who I think I am. <clears throat> I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. And that's because mm. not only are we obsessing with the thoughts and feelings in our heads and the stories we're telling ourselves, we're imagining the stories other people are telling us. So we don't want to say no because the, we are overinflating the impact of our no and other people. And we have this obsession of thinking about what other people think of us and making decisions based on that. So not only is it madness of your own thoughts and feelings that don't exist, you're imagining other people's thoughts and feelings that don't exist. And we all have an ego bias whereby we're all thinking about ourselves, really. No one yeah. cares enough to be overly thinking. And, I, you know, like I said, I coach people. And one of the women I coach, I was trying to get her to leave her phone while we went for a walk. And she wouldn't in case she got a call. And I, and I was like, what do you think is going to happen? She's a really senior, really well-respected woman. She said, well, it, I, I just can't. And I eventually got her to listen to the story that her unconscious mind wasn't even vocalizing. It was just kind of this fear and it was, I'll leave my phone at home. Someone will ring. They'll, I won't answer. They'll think I'm flaky. They'll talk about me. My reputation will be damaged. I'll lose my job. I'll lose my house. I'll die homeless. And, and, and you know, that's, it wasn't a conscious thing. So being aware of that fear that drives us and, and choosing when to listen to it and when not is, is really powerful. That's huge. You, you wrote, I think maybe over the summer, um, you, you gave an example of yourself. You'd went to a festival and you were having a lovely time, but you actually cut it short because you were like, yeah. no, that's it. Enough. Thank you. I'm tired. And I had Jomo, which is the joy of missing out. So the, it was it was the Soho House Festival. And I left, I got in a cab at nine and it went on till I think 10.30. Mm -hmm. And I was home before, I mean, when everyone leaves at 10.30 when it finishes, you cannot get any, you can't get on a tube, yeah. you can't get in a train, you can't get a cab. And I was home by the time everyone finished. I miss Pete Tong. So I was a bit gutted about that. But I was home. I was home with the kids. You know, I got home. The whole family was playing ping pong in the back garden. And I would have missed that, you know. You missed it. I yeah, missed it. It's, 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 I, I, I turned 50 this year. So it's gone from nothing good happens after midnight to nothing good happens after 9 p.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's, it's very true. It, it, you say about people thinking about what other people are thinking about mm. and that is such a wasted pointless exercise I, again i say say to the kids two percent think three percent think they think 95 percent would rather die than think the mm. chances of somebody that you're engaged with or thinking that you know that they yeah like you said that they're talking about they're thinking about what am i going to have for my dinner what are you know yeah, well, look, at, them, look at my nails yeah, absolutely. I think it's I think it's really cool. What um what kind of lessons have you brought into both Glow London and also your family from the Slow the Fuck Down episode? I mean, the conversation we're having, <clears throat> talking more about manifesting and, and outcome setting. Me and the kids have a parking fairies when we're going somewhere. So we go, right, where are we going to park? Let's manifest. Well, I mean, obviously that's that isn't something you can control, but it does work. So you know, we talk about outcome setting all the time. We have, in fact, I don't know if you can see it, but we've got goals. This is our yep. Yep. goals for the week. So everyone writes their goals and what we want. So what we, we usually have a Sunday dinner. So we're kind of manifesting how we want to feel on, on a Sunday. Um, I mean, and at Glow, we're doing more and more work with the culture. Uh, you know, we're kind of at the position now where if someone gives us a brand brief, we'll say, what's the cultural element to this and if we can't do the culture work we we might say look if you're not going to connect people internally into this and then it might not be the brief for us because helping people with this kind of thinking and this kind of behavior the work i've been doing the last two days with the client started with the, the lessons of slow the fuck down so you kind of immediately get the the leadership team in a place where they are prepared to and, you know, armed with ways to look after themselves better. And then you're giving them clarity. So we talk a lot about elite team principles of why, what and how is, you know, making sure we have clarity of purpose with our why, focus areas of our what that are measurable, and then the behaviours we sign up to that are how. 
So really, because of knowing the importance of life and and you know the importance of humanity and all those things that you get with a perspective when you think you know you you might have died and listen i'm not a different person i'm not a monk who has given up everything i'm not you know i'm still emma i still drink tequila um i just do everything in moderation i mean something we didn't talk about is the fact that the cardiologists still don't know why this happened so i think that's the message it was a perfect storm of exhaustion and stress mm a lot of coffee and mm. it was just one of those things but it wasn't my time so to take those gifts of the fact that it was you know if i'd have walked made it to the loo where i was headed i wouldn't be here mm. if god forbid i mean my worst fear is if that had happened while i was at home on my own with the kids i mean oh my god they would have had to watch me die i mean that's just the worst thing i'm so blessed so how can i not take forward these lessons and share them with other people um so yeah that's how it's become the slow the fuck down movement because it's a part of how we create culture and how we help people it's become very integrated in what we do with our clients 